Welcome to the media ministry of Lake Highlands Church. Please enjoy today's guest speaker. For those who, for those who don't know, Bob leads, leads a secret life. It's not as a professional golfer. It's as an evangelist. He's gone all over the world with uh, several organizations, Global Advance and uh, Joshua Nations. Nations. And so uh, we're grateful to have him here this morning. I just wanted to pray over his time. Lord, we're grateful for Bob and his life given to you, his ministry given to you. And we just are thankful for our morning. We pray, God, for your spirit to be alive and well and living in him this morning, and that our hearts will be open to everything he has to say in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hey, at least I don't have my fingers in your mouth. You know, usually when I'm talking, I have, I have my fingers in somebody's mouth. So if you quit paying attention, I may just go up and say, I'm going to stick my finger in your mouth, and you'll, you'll probably wake up. Let's go ahead and pull up the first slide, please. Um, John the Baptist. John the Baptist was the warm-up band for the Jesus tour. Back in the day when a king or an official would come to a city, they would send a forerunner to head to announce his coming. Matter of fact, depending on the royalty level, Sometimes they'd rebuild the whole city in advance of the king's visit. And they would send a forerunner to get everybody to shape up, ready for the king. John the Baptist had a difficult task because John the Baptist came into a very, very dark world. It was a dog-eat-dog survival of the fittest world where the government was corrupt and oppressive. They didn't just not tolerate protesters, they crucified them. But the religious leaders weren't any better because the religious leaders practice law. They practice law in order to gain for their own ends because it was all about power and control in those days. And if you had enough power and you had enough control, then you could survive, and it was about survival. So John had a difficult task because John's message was 180 degrees different from this message. His message was a message of relationships and righteousness. When they asked Jesus, what's the greatest commandments? He asked them, he said, what are the greatest commandments? And the guy that got it right said, well, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says, you got it. Those are the greatest two, which would indicate that the rest are less, right? So John had a difficult task. Um, they wanted to take advantage. Let's go on to the next slide. John realized that his, his, his whole purpose was to change the way people think. You know, a lot of times you look at what people do and we're appalled or surprised, and we don't get it. And we say, you know, you need to change what you do. You need to change how you act. The only way you can change what you do is you have to change what you believe, and that was John's purpose. And so when John, when he wrote John, John the Baptist's purpose, was also John the Apostle's purpose, and when he wrote this, he said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory. And so when John the Apostle started writing, he said, the Word, which is Jesus, was in the beginning. And the Word was God. Now, I'm going to take you on a little brain tour this morning because we don't really see it that way, do we? Go to the next slide. So Jesus did his ministry, and he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's the end. It was fourth down and 35, and time's running out on the clock. And they got 11 guys left and two kind of raggedy swords, and they got the whole Sanhedrin coming down on them. They've been up all night praying and sweating. And, Jesus, and Philip turns around, and he makes the same statement that I've made. I said, Jesus, I want to see the 60-foot angel at the head of my bed. Have you ever prayed that prayer? I'm backed into a corner here. Actually, what he says is, show us the Father, and we're good. That sounds like a good idea. Jesus said, we're backed in here. He says, show us the Father. That'll be good enough for us. And Jesus turns around to Philip and says, you're looking at him. 
You're looking at the Father. You're looking at God. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. We don't see that whole thing quoted on the Christmas card. But it does say, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace, doesn't it? Jesus is God. Go to the next slide. There's God. Let me tell you a story. I grew up a Church of Christ child. I bet a bunch of you in here did too. And I was, way, rain, I was weaned on an oak pew in the College Church of Christ in Las Cruces, New Mexico. And I was there on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, and for every meeting. And we didn't have children's church because church was serious business. And we didn't have no instruments because that was the Catholic's idea a thousand years ago, and we're going to put that one to bed. All right. Well, fast forward. <laughs> and I was a spirit chair for the Church of Christ. I was actually the guy that told Diane Garnett that she wasn't a real Christian because she wasn't properly baptized, <laughs> mainly because she's baptized by Don Harris. But anyway, uh, that was a lot of you know Don Harris. So I was messed up, and I went through a lot of stuff, but in 1988, in, under the tutelage of Don Harris and Randy Norman, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. And that's a long story we don't have time to get into, but after that happened, I left the church. How many of you ever done that? Yeah. You're going to hear from your relatives when you do it. Uh, left the church and went to a Baptocostal church in Richardson. And so when we started going there, the first time we went, my oldest son was probably about seven or eight years old, and we walked in, and of course the band was going, and, and uh, Logan looked at the band, he kind of had this wide-eyed look on his face, and I said, well, what do you think of that? Now, mind me, we've been in Church of Christ the whole time. And he said, pretty neat, Dad. And I said, okay, we'll go with it. So fast forward about seven or eight years, we're in another church in Rockwall, Texas. And there was a young man in the worship team, and we're there, and that, you know, even though you intellectually understand about things, it's, sometimes it's hard to really get it all the way through your brain. So this guy, young guy on electric guitar, and he was really good. And partway into the worship service, he starts going off on this guitar solo. This was like a Van Halen guitar solo. My hair was growing while he read it, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and so I was going like, man, you know, um, at first, I was a little put off by it because it's just beyond my comfort zone. Then I corrected myself. I said, no, this young man is worshiping the Lord. He is sincere. He's really worshiping God. And, uh, and then my next thought was, okay, I'm good with that. Then my next thought was, I wonder what God thinks about this. And it was the most clear time in my life I have ever heard the voice of God. It completely bypassed my ears and went rocketing into my brain. You want to know what he said? He said, I am not old. <laughs> That's all he said. You know, you don't get to live to be eternity by getting old. And so what I realized was, is my concept of God was this. I learned what God was from this guy who lived hundreds of years ago. And that my concept of God was deteriorating to the next slide. This guy. God had become a character. It's kind of funny. It's kind of sad in a way because, you know, God's old and, you know, kind of, kind of working it around. And what if God is this guy? This was done recently by a nine-year-old girl that met him. Nine years old, painted this after she was supernaturally gifted by God to paint. Another story we don't have time to go into, but you can Google it. Prince of Peace is the name of the painting.
Go to the next slide. Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. Jesus was there. He didn't say I was. Now, if you get this concept that Jesus is God, then what do you have to do? You have to go back to what we call the Old Testament, to which Paul called the Scriptures, and figure out who God really is with that in mind. And that'll make your brain work hard. God's not old. God's not retired. And what I realized was that I had mullet theology. <laughs> Y'all know what a mullet is? These guys might not know what a mullet is. But if you, if you Google... 80s country singers, you will see a mullet. You know, business in the front, party in the back. All right? And that's how I read the Bible. You know, business in the Old Testament, party in the New Testament. Business in the front, party in the back. And God is not bipolar. Because if you, if you realize you have mullet theology, you start having this dual view of God. And then they start to compete, and you're like, which one's really the real guy? Let's look at who the real guy is. Next slide. He says, permit the children to come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will not enter at all. God wants, loves and wants to be around children. Why? Why? I got my grandson here. Yay! Okay. I don't have a picture of him. I brought him. <laughs> okay. So anyway, no, it's actually his parents did, but he, I'll take credit for it. He looks just like me. Well, except he looks like his dad, but he looks like me too. Anyway, so I have my grandson here, and, and he's, he's two, and his vocabulary is limited. And, uh, but well, this is what you know about children, little children, is they want to find out stuff. If you've ever been around children, they are desperate to figure stuff out. They're desperate to figure out your cell phone. They're desperate to figure out your TV remote. They're desperate to figure out how to take your TV apart because their survival depends on figuring stuff out. When you're a little kid, you realize that you are weak and you're helpless unless you figure stuff out. And you are desperate to know things. How many of you have ever tried to give advice to somebody who doesn't want to know? doesn't work out too well, does it? You know, I finally figured out, even though I may know the right answer, the person I'm talking to is not, answering the, not asking the right question. And so Jesus loves to be around children because that childlike attitude says, I want to hear. I want to figure it out. I want to know what's going on. There's more to this than what it appears. All right. So God loves and wants to be around children. Go to the next slide. So we have this idea that uh, we got the law and all its rules and regulations and do's and don'ts, and the Pharisees were practicing the law the best they knew how, but they were manipulating the law, just like our current law people do sometimes, to their own ends or to the benefits of people that would benefit them. And the law would do them, allow them to do certain things like make people exchange their sacrifices for approved sacrifices plus a serious sum of money or exchange their money for official money. And so all these little laws were added to the main law in order to deliver power and control over people who are experts in the law. All right? And so we have this situation. And you may think, okay, how can the God who opened up the ground in Korah's rebellion and swallowed everybody up, or had the Canaanites totally massacred by the Israelites, or do all these things that are so dramatic and so ostensibly bloody and warlike and all that, how can that be the same guy that we got here in the New Testament? How do these match up? One clue is this interesting story. You know the story. They bring in this woman, she's caught in adultery. She has broken the law. And they got started at that. And Jesus sits down and he starts writing, doesn't he? You remember that? Starts writing in the sand. And you know, the Bible doesn't say what he was writing, but you know what? I got a guess. You know what my guess is? My guess is this. He's sitting there writing one, 
two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Just like he wrote it twice in tablets on the mountain. The same guy is writing in the sand. They wrote him on the tablets on the mountain. And those old guys start looking at this and they're watching this and they're saying, this is not going well. And they decide, we're going to leave. And the young guys that are disciples of the old guys see the old guys turn around and leave and think, they probably know something we don't. It's a good idea we leave too. And they do. Why? Because nobody could live up to that. Nobody got an A. Nobody could totally follow the law. And they knew where Jesus was going. Jesus was about to expose them for the hypocrites that they were. And they didn't want to be exposed. And they said, you know, the exposure is more dangerous than this situation. We're going to leave. And so then Jesus turns around and asks the woman, said, did no one condemn you? And she said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, I don't condemn you either. What? <laughs> the guy that wrote the law is not condemning the woman. He said, go, and from now on, sin no more. You see, God doesn't want to get us in trouble. He wants to get us out of trouble. Go to the next slide. This is a 1970 green Pontiac four-door Bonneville. I'm putting this up because these children have never seen one because they're all toasters now. They've been crushed, melted, and done away with. This is not a collectible car. Matter of fact, I really had a hard time getting an, even an internet picture of a hard top because most of the ones that even exist now are all convertibles. The reason I put this up here is because in 1970, I was 13 years old, and my mother drove one. Now, my parents were capitalists. Kim's parents were socialists. She got, a, she got her allowance no matter what. My parents were capitalized, capitalists. I had to earn my allowance. And so part of my earning my allowance is I had weekly chores. I had to shine the shoes, sweep the sidewalks, and wash the car. And the car had a lot of chrome on it, you may notice. And so one day, there was a new product in our house that says cleans everything, and I was going to do a really good job on the car, so I washed the Bonneville with Pine Sol. <laughs> now, paint was not sophisticated back then. Paint's pretty sophisticated now. It wasn't that sophisticated back in that day. And you know what Pine Sol does to a green Bonneville? <laughs> it turns it white. <laughs> and you think that car's ugly now. Holy moly. Now, my mother, she was a force to be reckoned with. She was raised by a drunk Irishman in a family of 14 on a farm in the Depression. Went through Korea, World War II, uh, Great Depression, you name it. My mother was a no-nonsense woman, let me tell you that. And they said John Glenn was the first man in orbit, but... Mm, in 1970, Laureen Weiss was the first woman in orbit, and I thought she was going to kill me. I mean, really. I mean, it, it, was, it was normally, it was on pins and needles at our house all the time, but oh boy, this time I was in serious trouble. Later afternoon, that after, I sweated all day long. My mother was screaming, yelling, pitching a fit. Oh, we're going to have to repaint the car. It's going to cost $700, and we're going to die, you know, and because uh, she wasn't going to drive it like that, I guarantee you. And my dad uh, came back and he handed me a can of rubbing compound. And he said, this is how you'll fix the car. And he showed me how to use rubbing compound, you know, wax on, wax off. This was rub on, hope it comes off. And it did. But see, my father came in and rescued me. He got me out of trouble. And he did it two ways. Number one, number one he knew something I didn't know. He knew how to fix a messed up car. And number two, he gave me the tools to do it with. You know, a lot of times we get in a jam when we pray for a miracle. Well, I, that's good. You know, God does operate in miracles from time to time. There's miraculous healings. I've seen healings. I've seen deliverances. I've been out. I've been in Russia. I've been all kinds of crazy places. I've seen a lot of wild stuff, Africa, you name it. 
But most of the time, God's there with a can of rubbing compound. He said, I'm giving you the tools to fix it. What did Paul say when he wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16, 17? He said, all scripture is inspired by God. I found out later as an adult that scripture is the Old Testament. Because when that was written, the New Testament didn't exist. Okay? And Paul was not a guy that said, you got to follow the law. Right? I mean, Paul stood against Judaizing teaching. He said, this is not about following the law. This is about recognizing that all Scripture was written for a reason. If you want wisdom, you're going to find it in the Scriptures. You're going to find it in the Old Testament. You may look at me and say, well, what's there? Stuff like, don't co-sign a note. I mean, we wish you read that one. <laughs> How many of you are paying your kids student loans because you co-sign the note? Okay? There's a lot of stuff in there. But it's not only that. There's a lot of stories. There's a lot of cautionary tales. There's a lot of things that happen to bad people. And there's a lot of good things that happen to bad people. I was, you know, my mother went to church all her life, but she just got all her teaching from sermons. There was no real push to read it for yourself and figure it out on your own. And uh, one time we got in this discussion, I said, <laughs> do you know who the mother of Solomon is? <laughs> she didn't know. I said, Bathsheba is the mother of Solomon. Now, Bathsheba was taking a bath and he shebed her, okay? So, I mean, <laughs> if you want to remember the name, that's a good way to remember it. Bathsheba got David in a lot, David got in a lot of trouble over Bathsheba, okay? And the first child died, but the second child was Solomon. God can fix anybody, anywhere, in any situation and make their life change for the better. And all you really need to do is know the right information. You really don't. You know, you don't know what you don't know and you suffer because of it. All right, let's go to the next slide. Go to the next slide, there you go. If you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? God loves us more than any earthly father because he has the capacity to. Now, here's a really interesting thing that I've learned over the last few years. When I say the word father to you, what comes to your mind instantly? Your own father, usually. Your own biological father. And uh, the problem, the, that's a two-edged sword because the further your father was from God, the more distorted your view of God is. And as a matter of fact, Joanna sent me an article, or Ariel sent me an article uh, last week about a study that this guy did about the most influential atheists of our time. And every one of them, their father was either dead when they were very young or very cold and distant and ineffectual. So when you say father to a person like that, Father is dead or uncaring or worse. And then you tell them God is your heavenly father. They don't make the leap to God. Now, I was really fortunate. I had a great dad. And that really gave me a leg up. And I appreciate that. And I'm just grateful to God that that happened. But that may not be true for you. And you may sit there and say, you know, my dad wasn't that great a guy. You know, he was abusive or he was absent or he was dead or I never knew him or whatever. And that may be difficult for you to make this jump when I say father from father to heavenly father. But Jesus recognized that because the crowd he was talking to, he said, you're all evil. <laughs> Compared to me, 
Every one of your fathers is evil. It's not a matter as if your father was good or bad. It was just a matter of how bad. So he said, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more with your heavenly father, and one, and one reference in one gospel says, give good gifts to those who love him. And then this one in Luke, he says, give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. Let me tell you what, the Holy Spirit is the best gift you can possibly get from your father. And if you're unsure, because it's not automatic. What? Okay, it's not. It's not automatic, it's available. Sometimes it comes at the same time you accept Christ as your savior or you're water baptized or whatever you say, this is my spiritual start point. Sometimes it comes that way, but for me it did not. I was one messed up puppy. And it wasn't until in my 30s that I even found out about the Holy Spirit. Oh, I knew he was a retired author, I got that. But I did not know that he had any influence over my life or had the ability to. If anybody had talked to me and said, do you have the Holy Spirit living in you? I said, well, I guess it's part of the package deal. But I was messed up and I was sad and Kim was mad. I was suicidally depressed and my wife was ready to kill me. And so, Fortunately, in 1988, my life totally changed. Um, I, didn't, I found out about the Holy Spirit, did a lot of studying, teaching on it, whatever, and wound up at the hands of Don Harris and Randy Norman right there. And in Don's old office in Garland, Don and Randy did a deliverance session, and I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. And so I can say that you got at least one guy here with a lot of, with experience. So uh, there's other guys here too. But, but I, I've never forgotten that, and I've always been grateful to Randy and Don for their willingness to take a guy like me who was pretty messed up and uh, lead him through things that totally changed his life. That's the greatest gift that God can ever give you because once you understand and once you meet God then forever on, you're able to determine the difference between righteousness and unrighteousness. You know what righteousness is? Making things right. It's not following rules. It's making things right. Okay? And that's what the Holy Spirit helps you to determine, among other things. Let's go to the next slide. What about this guy? (laughs) He's not the guy you think of when you say father figure, is he? Let me read you an article. Not a lot of it. Let's read a little bit of it. Jones is well known for his strong bond with players. He often given players second and sometimes third chances after they failed the drug test or even been arrested. Jones is an eternal optimist. It's a hard time turning his back on anyone who's been loyal to him. It's why many players look at Jones more like a father figure than a boss. Josh Brent spent five months in jail for intoxicated manslaughter. Upon Brent's release, Jones continued to support him, helped him get a job at a local warehouse driving a forklift. In November 2014, Jones gave Brent a chance to revive his NFL career, signing into a one-year contract, despite the fact that he hadn't played in two years. Brent never could retain his form and retired for a second time in 2015, but he's still around with the team every day as an intern helping with coaching and scouting. And there's a player named Pac-Man. The Cowboys traded for Pac-Man Jones after he'd been suspended for the entire 2007 season because of multiple incidents. And he goes on to say that uh, how to deal with the Dallas bodyguards, and he wound up uh, playing for Cincinnati. In October, Pat Mann, now a cornerback for Cincinnati, interrupted Jones' sideline interview before the game against the Cowboys. Well, Jerry Jones said, one of my favorites and one of the guys I'm proudest of. Jones genuinely cares for his players, and while they're scoring touchdowns for him and long after they've retired, his respect with players runs so deep that three of his Hall of Fame Cowboys, Michael Irvin, Emmett Smith, and most recently, Larry Allen, 
selected him to present them during their induction ceremonies into the Hall of Fame. You can say what you want about Jerry Jones. You may be still mad at him for firing Tom Landry. One thing the guy does know, he knows how to be a father. I don't even know if he's a churchgoer. Okay, I don't know anything about Jerry Jones. But I read that article and I said, this guy knows how to be a father. And you may look at this and say, man, you know, <laughs> I'm not qualified to be a spiritual father to anybody. I got stuff in my life. I got failures. This guy is. You can too. You have something to give. You have something to offer. If we're going to build relationships in this church, we're going to have to have people step up. We're going to have to have people be spiritual fathers and spiritual parents and spiritual mothers. And we're going to have to have people know that that's available. They should know it's available. And, you know, we got four great elders. God bless them. But, you know, there's 200 of us still. <laughs> and so, you know, they can't handle all 200 of us. They don't have relationships with all of us. And it's, it's all about building relationships with one another and parenting and being children to one another. Let's go to the next slide. It said, let us love one another. For love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. The basis information you need to be a spiritual parent is God is love, and I'm reflecting God. If you're not reflecting God in your relationships, then you're not being a spiritual parent. You're just messing it up, okay? And so the first thing is, is God is love. What's in the best interest of this person that I'm dealing with? A great stumbling block to our relationship with God and Heavenly Father is our flawed relationship with our own earthly fathers. And a lot of times I've met people that have a seriously flawed relationship with their earthly fathers, and it's caused all kinds of problems. Even health problems can be traced back primarily to unforgiveness directed towards a parent particularly a father, sometimes a mother, and that residual unforgiveness leads to problems later on down the road, not the least of which is unforgiveness indirectly directed at God. There's a lot of people out there that are mad at God because they think that their life circumstance is a result of his inattention or worse, his will. Okay? And that's not true. Let's go to the last slide here. Yay, last slide. <laughs> I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of light. Mike Bickle says it's hard to pray to a sad, mad, disappointed God. If that's the God you're praying to, you need to get the big eraser out and polish that away. He's not mad at you. He's not disappointed at you. And he's not sad. There is nothing that you can do that's going to break that relationship. Any of you who have children know that even if they go to prison, you are still their parent. Okay? And we're crummy parents. Can you imagine what the perfect parent feels? You understand that? Do you think that when you go out and you commit a sin, that God sits back there and wrings his hands and said, Gabriel, I can't believe she did that. No. God is an informed investor. Before you were ever born, he knew everything that was going to happen. There is no surprises with God. It grieves him. It's a load of information that would be unbelievable to bear to know what people's future are when they sign on to the program. But don't ever let the lie of Satan back you into the corner and say, you've messed up so bad, there's no going back from this. Because that's a lie. And the other lie is, 
If I do this, nobody will know, and it won't affect anybody but me. And that one doesn't fly either. Because the same guy that wrote in the sand is the same guy that wrote it in stone. The principles of the scriptures are always true. Now, we're meeting on Sunday, not Saturday, but the principle is true. Don't work seven days a week. It'll wear you out, it's counterproductive, and you won't make any more money, okay? God can make you money while you sleep, other principle. Don't sleep so much, but you can, all right? Okay, so we're at the end of the deal here, and this is the time when I say, oh yeah, what are we gonna do now? I'm gonna pray for y'all. I'm gonna pray that you will have a greater understanding of God than you currently had before you came in here. And then at the end of the service, if some of this touched you in a way that, you know, I don't, I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hands and stand, whatever. but I mean, if, if you are saying in your mind, you know, I'm really, I'm really messed up here. I really realize now how my relationship, particularly with my earthly dad, affected my life. And I need more prayer than this, the one that I'm going to deliver now. Or maybe you sit there and say, you know, I, I, I don't really know much about this Holy Spirit deal. And we're going to have a class on how we're, uh, some fellow's going to lead a class in the Holy Spirit, and I strongly recommend that you go to that class. And I'd be glad to pray for anybody to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And Randy would come up and help me, and the elders would come up. And let me tell you about my own experience with this. When I discovered about praying for the Holy Spirit, because there's a deal in the Bible. Did you know that? There's an irrevocable deal in the Bible that says, if you ask for the Holy Spirit, he will give the Holy Spirit to you. Yep, that's the deal. There is no other deal. It does not necessarily say when. Okay? And when I asked for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, Kim and I prayed in a car on the way back from visiting friends after reading a book on the subject. And we prayed, and it was like crickets. Nothing happened, okay? <laughs> but it set into motion a chain of events that ultimately led it to happen within a few months. And so you say, look, I've never experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I don't know anything about that. We'd be glad to pray for you to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and it may happen right now. It may happen a few months from now. Don't get all torqued up on if it happens or not, okay? Don't let that be part of you. Because, you know, you sign the deal, it's either happening or you're in the queue, you know? You're in line. I mean, it's going to happen, <laughs> all right? Okay. So, Father, I just pray for my brothers and sisters, and I pray for your word. I pray for their understanding of you a little bit better, to understand that you are the God of the entire Bible, that you're the God that made the rules and you're also the God that gave up his life for us because the rules are just designed to get us to you. And so Father, we all wanna be near you, we all wanna know you, we all wanna love you, we all wanna have that relationship with you that's greater than any experience that we ever hope to have. And I, Father, I pray for each and every one here that this next year, that they would come to know you, that they would come to love you, and they would want to find you. In Jesus' name, amen.